be a question. Yeah. <laughs> so I got a question from Paul, and Paul says, when you're measuring hip flexion, do you like to use a hip scour before you test the compressive hip flexion position? I was curious if you'd change the angle of your hip flexion if an individual showed signs of impingement or a pinching sensation in the imaginary sagittal plane of testing. I love the fact you use the imaginary sagittal plane, uh, Paul, so keep, keep the questions coming. Um, would you just use the measurement right before those issues occur? Okay, so we've got a couple things going on here. I'm going to hand this to the panel on. So, um, and we'll, we'll use Nikki's hip flexion because she's actually got some pretty good motion here that you'll be able to see on camera. But the thing that I want you to understand, Paul, first and foremost, is that I'm never going to push somebody through uh, a sensation of, of what would be considered a pinching or an impingement. There's nothing gained from that. It doesn't tell me anything. It doesn't give me anything of value. In fact, I would appreciate knowing that there is a stop there because I'm going to use that to determine, along with my other measures of the chessboard, as to what the orientation of this hip socket is. Um, because it's going to tell me whether I have an orientation issue or a socket orientation issue based on the combined measures of internal rotation and external rotation of the hip. Now, let's go to the second part of your, your question about the hip scour. So the hip scouring test is traditionally me trying to take the hip through this entire arc of motion with the theory being that I'm taking this femur and I'm sort of for lack of a better term, scraping my way around the outside edge of the acetabulum. The reality is, is that there's a, there's a fluid compartment between the femur and the acetabulum at, at all times. There's no physical contact that's taking place, nor will I be able to discern the actual shape of the hip socket from this test. It's virtually impossible to do that because as I move Nikki through this range of motion, her pelvis is actually going to move through space too. So, so for me to, to, to take the leap that I can actually identify the physical shape or the depth of the socket, I, I, think it, I think we're going well beyond what that test can actually offer us. What it can offer me though, Paul, is it can show me the transitions between internal rotation and external rotation of the hip. So what I want you to see from this angle, so as I take Nikki across this way, this is actually an externally rotated position of the hip because the acetab, or, sorry, the trochanter is actually moving inferiorly as I move her across this way. So the hip is actually moving towards external rotation. As I move her outward away from midline, this is where a lot of people get confused because they say, oh, you're abducting and external, externally rotating the hip. This isn't true. What's actually happening here, Paul, is that I'm actually internally rotating her hip because her trochanter is actually moving this way, so it's actually internal rotation. And so the value of me moving through that excursion is that I can actually identify the transition between internal and external rotation. The cool thing is, is that transition tends to be in my straight plane hip flexion measure. So what this tells me then, Paul, is that my, my hip flexion measure is actually representative of the ability to externally rotate the hip, which now gives me value in my assessment that if somebody's lacking hip flexion, chances are I have an exhalation strategy that is restricting my hip motion. Now, my intervention is going to be infinitely more successful than if I just said, oh, I need to stretch something to reacquire hip flexion, when the reality is, is I need expansion in that pelvis that is being restricted by the exhalation strategy. So hopefully I've answered your question for you, Paul. If I didn't, please ask another question.